What were the three most important questions that you would ask in your role in order to help build the best product possible? Almost the number one question is, what is the problem we're trying to solve? And maybe a related question is, who are we solving it for? And then the third one would be, what's the best way to solve it? So start with, why are we doing this? Who are we doing this for? And then come back to, how should we build it? This episode is with Vinkat Rapaka, head of product at Arta Finance and former VP of product management at Google for the past 12 years. Arta Finance is here to democratize private banking. Please sit back and enjoy this episode of Next Big Thing HQ Podcast. Thank you. I think um, for me, there's a phrase, you know, ideas are a dime a dozen, but the people that actually implement the idea are priceless. And when I look at Arta Finance's team, it is like a group of very experienced, brilliant veterans that decided, hey, we can do this and we can do this better than everyone else. So how important do you think a team is when it comes to a startup and executing on the idea? Connor, you're speaking straight to my heart. In fact, that phrase that you said is something that I talk about a lot or I use a lot as well. In some ways, like I think a number of us are very lucky to be born at a time when there are amazing things happening in the world around us and we have the privilege of getting to work on a bunch of these very exciting stuff to give us there for the luxury of picking who you want to work with. All I've always tried to choose what I tend to do is much more pick the right kind of people because whether you succeed or fail, you will always try to do something audacious. And whether you win or lose, you will have fun along the way and you'll learn a ton. Uh, and that's how I've tried to run my life. Uh, so it, it speaks straight to me. Yeah. So... It seems like a common thread with a lot of the people working on Art of Finance is the next billion user initiative, Google. So is that where a lot of the team met? And is that where the genesis of the idea really started? Actually, our journey goes back a lot earlier than that. I think a number of us started working together back on uh, Chromebooks more than a decade ago. Okay. Late 2000s, uh, early 2010 timeframe. And uh, the number of us worked on and the project called Chrome OS or Chrome to our candidates. And there was the lead of our product area at that time. And a number of us worked with him and we bootstrapped that entire effort of building laptops to try and bring something that is accessible to everyone. And that's where a lot of us met. And through our time at Google, we worked on a number of products together. We worked on Android and then a lot of us worked together on next billion users on Google. So yeah, we've been together for a very long time. So you started working at Google 2010 you were the VP of product management at Google. You worked on projects like Chromebook and then Google Pay, Google Payment Platforms, Google Finance, and you helped with Pixel. Mm -hmm. So tell me, what was that period like? Because Google is probably, if not the most innovative company ever. What was that period like working for Google? And then what was your day-to-day -day job like? Yeah, when I joined in 2010, I couldn't believe that they let me in. I'm not even joking. Like it was all the things. <laughs> Why? Yeah, the, the kind of people I got to work with, and a lot of them are at Ada right now with me. The kind of people I got to work with were just absolutely brilliant. Very high performing people, yet incredibly humble. I talked to somebody just before I joined who had started a unicorn back in the dot-com days, just before the dot-com days, where founding a company that exists well over a billion dollars was actually a very big deal. And his introduction to me was, I used to work at startups before. So incredibly humble, understated people, but incredibly accomplished. And every day I'd come into work and I felt like I was learning in every single interaction from a number of these brilliant people. And I couldn't believe my luck. They pay me to come hang out with this crowd. And so that's how it was. On a day-to-day -day basis, the work changed over time, but a lot of it was trying to think of the best way to build a product that in the early days it was more about making computing accessible to everyone. Later, it was about making mobile phones accessible to everyone. Later, it was about making digital payments accessible to everyone. And in that journey, there was another very interesting aspect that is a common thread, which is not just building a product that our company would deliver, but working with an entire ecosystem of providers across the entire value chain to try and build a very healthy, robust ecosystem so that everybody can participate and win. And that's kind of our DNA as a team is to, is to build a, not just a product, but a platform and an ecosystem. 
I want to talk about that a little bit later, but you said you always thought about what's the best way to build a product. So what were the three most important questions that you would ask in your role in order to help build the best product possible? I think almost the number one question is what is the problem we're trying to solve? And maybe a related question is who are we solving it for? And then the third one would be what's the best way to solve it? So start with why are we doing this? Who are we doing this for? And then come back to how should we build it? I've rarely tried to start with, I have a capability or a technology and how do I implement it or, or deliver it? That has always for me as a product manager felt backwards. So you start with the problem and then work your way back. But I find a lot of people, they usually start with the problem, but they don't think deep enough about the problem. They almost kind of mislead themselves into, oh, this is a problem and then work their way backwards don't really solve it. So do you go like more in depth in order to find the nuance of the problem? I think it depends on the exact problem. Sometimes there is an instinct of what you think the problem might be, and you might not be sure if the audience you're going after realizes it fully or not. But a lot of times, you know, you can find out by asking. A lot of times, you know, because you might be the actual user that you're targeting yourself. So yes, absolutely. I think you have to get dig deep to make sure that just because you can do something, you can talk yourself into there is value in this thing. You have to go talk to people and figure out if there's real value. And a lot of times I've always tried to ship fast because then you get the feedback. And if you have the right or idea, then you learn from how your users are using it or not using it. And what are they looking for in addition? Where do they spend the most time or where do they get the most value? And then you iterate from there. So this is a phrase that I think Google made pretty popular launching it, right? That's another way that you learn whether what you're building is useful or not. That's pretty similar to the build fast and break things kind of motto of YC, right? Similar, but not the same. Without disrespecting that phrase, I'll draw a nuance, which is, and separate them out a little bit, which is in some places, maybe it's okay to break things, but in a lot of areas where I have tended to work, I don't think it's okay to break things. And in fact, the place where I work right now, my last job at Google working on payments. These are regulated areas, but also more importantly, from my point of view, you're interacting with people on one of the more important aspects of their life, which is their finances, their money, their wealth. And there's a tremendous amount of responsibility that you have to feel, which a lot of us felt when you're handling that money. So for us, the mantra was always responsibly move things forward and not about more fast and break things. That makes sense. When you have more responsibility, you, you have to be more careful of the risks you take. But talking about the problems that you are trying to solve, what is the problem that Art of Finance is trying to solve? And Art of Finance are building a digital family office. And uh, it's a very personal problem at some level. So a lot of us, we've been at Google, we've been at Google from 2010 onwards, and we got to interact with a number of people both at Google and in the Valley, but especially at Google, people had been there from pre-IPO days. And when we would talk to them, we'd notice that they had access to these incredible financial products and services. And some of us didn't even know they existed. So if you look at our website, we refer to these as superpowers of the financial superpowers of the ultra wealthy. We would see these things from the senior execs, from people that were there from pre-IPO days. And as we grew at Google, as we accumulated our own financial you know, network, a lot of times we'd keep wondering how are they able to do this thing? And the more we learned about it, the more we realized that there are these things called family offices. And a family office is essentially a team of experts that cuts across all the aspects of your financial life. Most people in the early days of wealth accumulation think of that as investing in the stock market. But that itself is a very complex space. But beyond that, there's a whole additional set of alternative investments, private equity, venture capital, hedge funds, private credit, startup investments, then the ability to use tax strategies, the ability to use insurance as a wealth generating mechanism, the ability to use estate planning as a way to preserve and pass on your wealth to the next generation. And they had teams of experts that would look across everything and build a very cohesive and personalized solution for each of these people that we were interacting with. And for us, that was something we wanted. And out of finance is our attempt to build a product that can deliver that end-to-end -end cohesive financial solution for people like us. 
And then it, it's almost like democratizing private investing, right? To where these individuals who previously didn't have access to these high return, I don't want to say secretive, but very hard to access investments now can through Art of Finance. Absolutely. Absolutely. That's exactly the, the path we're taking. And then only a part of it is about investing. It's also about protecting and it's also about enjoying, right? The accumulated wealth. So you can also enjoy it. And also a lot of times to protect and then pass on to your next of kin. It's the entire holistic approach for us. So you mentioned Art of Finance has the estate planning and tax planning and then investing. Can you talk about some of the products maybe related to the investing aspect that help an individual maybe get a higher rate of return on investment or invest better than just a typical invest in the S&P 500? Yeah, absolutely. So let me talk about public markets, then we'll talk about private investments, which are a whole other category. Within public markets, we have a number of products that have already rolled out, some that we are on the verge of rolling out. We have AI managed portfolios, which are designed to deliver portfolios that include stocks or bonds or US treasuries. They're all designed for different use cases. There are people who want to invest in the stock market and the AI managed portfolio. All of these are the best possible risk adjusted return. That's what they're optimizing for. But there's an AI managed portfolio that's for stocks. Another one for bonds, because bonds tend to be not last two years, but tend to be inversely correlated and be a good hedge of, you know, of stocks. And then the last one was a product that we built earlier this year when we saw interest rates spiking and a lot of volatility in the market and people wondering what to do with their cash. And they're just holding on to their cash. And a lot of times they're sitting in bank accounts. I was also one of those people. Uh, so we built a product that invests in US treasuries, uh, gives an incredibly high rate of return. Um, especially if you're in a high tax bracket in a state like California, it can be tax equivalent well over 6% of return. So that's a set of products using AI. Then we have, I think we rolled out this week, a robo advisor product because they are simple to understand they're pretty mainstream and there's a very easy way for them to be buy into a diversified portfolio. So we have that as well. And we have a number of structured products that they're bringing in, which are on the face of it, a little bit more advanced but have really, really interesting attributes for people who either want to protect the money they have but want some exposure to the market or want to take a higher than market risk. We have a set of products that they're bringing out on the structured product side. So these are all the public markets. And then on the alternative investment side, as I was mentioning before, we have a series of private equity investments that we offer on the platform, as well as venture capital funds that you can invest in. We also have private credit and real estate funds. So going back to the uh, AI managed portfolios, can you talk more about how that works? And with AI, you have to have some sort of model, right? And have to have data in order for the AI to be effective. So can you talk about maybe the data aspect that helps manage the portfolios and make them super effective as well as kind of maybe the models? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I love how you went to the data first because a lot of AI people gravitate towards the model, but the model is only as good as the data you feed it. So I, I love what started there. We have two different versions or two different ways we think of ML AI within our company. Uh, let me talk about the investing side of it. And then there's a Gen AI, which we should come back to because it's a fascinating topic. Yeah, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, but let's first talk about ML as it pertains to investing uh, or in terms of portfolio management. So the data that we use in there, as you can imagine, very high quality data from well-established industry players. And the data cuts across aspects like pricing data for the last several decades of the various instruments on a daily basis, right? And various other aspects of individual securities like what is the market cap, what's the liquidity of each of these products and so on. But then we also augmented with very high quality data that talks about the risk profile or the risk decomposition or factor decomposition, these are phrases you may have heard, uh, of each of these securities that again comes from another very, very high quality provider. I can keep going because there's a ton of very high quality data that's very hard to get access to in the industry, but corporate actions, right? So there are all these kinds of data that we feed in. So that's the data side. And on the model side, the finance uh, is a very deep industry. We have a number of people at ADA who come decades of finance and payments experience. And so it's not that we're just a bunch of folks who only understand tech. We have a very deep financial expertise as well. 
and and it's a it's a complex space. So we're not trying to reinvent finance. We have taken very well established models that exist, which are much more about disciplined investing. It's not about chasing returns at any risk. It's all about risk management and and a very disciplined and systematic way of investing. So we have models that are trained for managing risk very carefully and then trying to get the best possible risk adjusted return at that level of risk. And they're also tuned, the ones we have currently in the product, those models are tuned for a long, long-term long investment horizon. Because again, what we're trying to build is not a hedge fund. In right. this stage, we're, that's not what we're doing, which is a, we're going to beat the market on a very short time frame. This is much more, somebody wants to invest for a very long period of time. How do we give them the tools to invest in a way that is risk adjusted return or a long period of time in a very personalized way? So that's what the models do. A quick example of that is when you think of personalizing, I work in the tech industry and I might have a risk appetite. My brother who lives in Chicago, works in the financial industry, might have the same risk appetite as me, but we should not have the exact same portfolio. My portfolio should probably be away from tech and he should lean away from finance and that complements the rest of the exposure that we each have. And the ability to do all of that is what the models are designed. That makes sense. It eliminates kind of the bias that you might have to a certain industry. It seems like the goal is to help optimize the best portfolio, right? You're, you're not trying to have massive returns year after year after year, just constantly chasing big gains because that just gets extremely risky. But you're trying to, it's almost like a game theory optimization, right? Like what's the best move to do in this position and just continuing to get better and better and better. Exactly. And when you say in this position, there's a lot of depth that you're indicating that I just want to surface, which is what stage of life am I in? What other exposures do I have? And that could be where I live, where I work, what else I hold in my portfolio. It could also be the phrase I like to use is sleep at night index. Some people are okay if their portfolio drops 20% in a market downturn and another person with the same long-term view might be very uncomfortable with that kind of a roller coaster ride. And you also need to adjust for that. Those are all the aspects that we are trying to build for, not just within this portfolio, but across all of ADA. How do we build an end-to-end financial picture that matches what the client wants? So if I were to create an account on Art of Finance, what information do I have to put in so that the AI can personalize the managed portfolios in order to kind of cater to my needs, my risk, maybe my risk appetite, the certain biases I might have? Is it a long list of questionnaires or is it just kind of gathering data over time and slowly managing the portfolio? It's much more of the latter because like a lot of people come to us and they might have come to us because they heard about a single product. And for example, we get a lot of people who come in for this product that I described before. It's called Harvest Treasuries. It invests in US, US treasuries and the yield is high. So people tell their friends and their friends show up and that's the product they want. And the last thing we want to do is collect a bunch of information about them before they can invest in that product. So I think there's a, a way to let people find the thing that solves their current problem and we can deliver that product to them in a very responsible way. But in the process, we can open the relationship and the dialogue with them to learn more about them, to lead them up into other products, and then advise them along the way. The other thing that uh, I just want to call out is that we are a registered investment advisor in RIA, and the very clear guidelines on what we can and cannot do. At the heart of all of that is what's called the fiduciary responsibility, which is we have to provide the best possible advice we can give you at any point in time. So we're very careful and collecting the right level of information so that we can surface only the right products. And then you only see the things that you're eligible to see based on what the regulations are not. That makes sense. And then you do have a partnership with Bank of New York Mellon, right? Yes. So can you talk about the importance that partnership plays with Art of Finance going forward? Yeah, absolutely. So in the space of investments, I'll describe how we are set up with Bank of New York, Mellon Pershing, that's their full name that the entity that we are working with. But we are an investment advisor, but if you open an account with us, what we will do is we'll actually open an account for you in your name with BNY Mellon Pershing. And BNY Mellon Pershing holds all your assets. We don't. What we do is 
we tell BNY Mellon how we want to manage those assets for you. So all of your assets are therefore held by a third party and BNY Mellon is one of the largest custodians of assets in the world, well over $40 trillion of assets. It's Bank of New York was started by Alexander Hamilton fun fact, 200 plus years ago. So a very long-standing, very well-respected bank. It's a very important signal of trust that we want our members to see. We refer to our clients as members. We want them to know that their money is safe with BNY Mellon Pershing. And in terms of the interaction between them and us, they've been an incredible partner to us as we try to do a number of things. We have done AI, automated portfolio management, and for all of that, we, we use them as the entity that holds the funds and executes the trades. And we are basically telling them or asking them, telling them what to do on each individual. And I think that's a really interesting marriage between you and then Bank of New York Mellon, just because, you know, as you said, Bank of New York Mellon is 200 plus years old, right? Yes. So it's extremely old. And then Art of Finance is super new in the fintech area. So just seeing the two come together, you can only... I just think about, you know, kind of the potential and what can happen in the future. But I do want to talk back about the alternative market investments, like investing in some PE deals or VC. Can you talk a little bit more about that and just how it's possible for an individual to get into those deals when before they never kind of had the access to those opportunities? Yeah, I think there's a lot in here. Let me break it down maybe a little bit more. Let's take private equity as an asset class. I've always known that private equity as an asset class existed for about a decade plus. I had no idea how they exactly worked for a very long time. I didn't know how to pick a good one. And I didn't know how much I should invest in it, right? Like, so there were a lot of these things that were all mysterious to me for a very long period of time. So what we are doing at ADA is we have people on our team that have spent decades in that industry sourcing deals, curating, evaluating, and bringing those deals to retail investors, the people have spent decades in that industry, right? So what we've done is like these folks go out and then they curate, evaluate, diligence the deal. And then they say, this deal or this particular fund is appropriate for our audience. Let's bring it onto the platform. So that's the finance part of it. Okay. The other part of it is the, the user understanding, the user experience part of it where if you've ever seen any of the investment prospectors or yeah. memos that come from those funds, they're incredibly detailed. And mm -hmm. they tend to be 50 to 100 pages long. And unless you are either really sophisticated or really interested in going really deep, it's very hard to understand, should I invest in this or not? Like, you know, what are the things I should look for to compare this to this other thing or versus whatever else I'm doing? So what we've done is, as a team, bringing the two experiences, expertises together, we go through those and we extract the right kind of information. And then we present it the right kind of way to say, this fund looks like this. Here's how a capital call structure works, which to me was mysterious until like five to seven years ago. I had no idea how that worked. You can commit $100,000. That doesn't mean you have to pay that on day one. It's called over three to five years. And it tends to be in this ratio. This particular fund manager historically has called 22% in year one, 27% in year two, and so on. That's not a guarantee, but it gives me a sense for how do I manage my cash flow if I sign up for this? And being able to exploit that information in a very systematic way, and then provide it in a way that's easy for someone who is maybe not as financially savvy or doesn't have the time, right? A lot of us are busy. How do we surface the right information the right way is a lot of what we've done. And also give you a fun example, if you set up an account and go into the app, you will also notice we have comics in place, literally a digital comic book, which describes what is a private equity investment or to think about it. In a way that makes it very engaging and accessible to people to understand what they're getting into, not a dry six-page document, but in a much more visual way to understand what it is. We have information sessions where experts post and talk about the asset class or individual funds and answer questions from our members. So there's a lot of education that we put in. That's what we're doing to make these things more accessible because only a part of it is actual access, but a lot of it is education so we can opt into it in a responsible way. Well, and you also have a podcast too. 
So you're doing like weekly podcast episodes. And I think that's great too, because a lot of finance, it's lingo that makes it sound way more complicated than it actually is. And it kind of deters an individual to want to learn it just because it sounds so complex and complicated at first. Yeah. And Art of Finance is doing a great job really breaking it down and simplifying it. I guess that's my biggest takeaway so far is that Art of Finance is as much of an education company when it comes to the finance industry as it is helping you invest and make more money than just keeping your cash in a checking account or savings account. I am curious because, you know, with the startup, as you grow the startup, you want to focus on the culture. And working at Google, you got to witness great company culture. You worked there, what, 10, 12 plus years? What are your biggest takeaways when it comes to company culture that you saw at Google that you're trying to implement at Art of Finance? I think the ability for people to to challenge the status quo, but in a responsible way, was something that I think a lot of us have learned or tried to learn during our time at Google. As an example, when we built Chromebooks, I had never worked on building a laptop before. When I worked on phones, I'd never built a mobile really? before. I had zero experience in that. Uh, when I went into the payment space, I hadn't worked on payments before. So a lot of times a fresh perspective is great because you think of it more like an end user of the product than as someone who understands all the capabilities under the hood. So it's actually easier to think of the problem than on capabilities. If you start there. But the risk is, is that if you don't know why the industry operates the way it does, why the regulations are shaped the way they are, then you have no idea which things are there because they are designed to protect companies, value chain, people, and consumers. And which things are there because that's just that how things were done before. And if there's a better way of doing it, it should be tried and we should advance that space carefully, right? So I think the balance of responsibly innovating was something that is absolutely needed in this space. And that's one of the big aspects of our culture here, which is don't be afraid to ask questions. Don't be afraid to challenge the status quo, but always with a learning mindset. The second one I was going to say is transparency. When I joined Google, it was just amazing to me. Having worked at many different places, I'd never seen a culture that was that transparent. When the board meeting happened, Eric Schmidt would come to TGIF the entire company's town hall and present the board deck and talk about what they discuss and where the company is heading. And anybody could ask any question and the founders would be up on the stage and they'd answer. Later, Sundar did it, right? And still does it. And that's the culture we're trying to emulate here as well, where we have the same, the same kind of very open culture internally where everything is shared to the head team. Yeah. I was listening to uh, the Lex Freeman podcast earlier today with Jeff Bezos on it. And he was talking about one of the most important things for a company is to create a culture where even the lowest level person can kind of question what the highest level person said, because that ability of kind of questioning the status quo and creating transparency is, is super important just for keeping the company honest and, you know, keep innovating new ideas. And that's something that I absolutely experienced firsthand at Google, where having joined teams where I had no experience in that industry. Android is a good example. Same thing with Chromebooks. I felt that the merit of my ideas were discussed as opposed to the merits of the dissent, right? So I never ever felt, what do you know about this space? It was much more, let's hear your idea. Let's hear your question and let's answer it as best as we can. And very early on in this conversation, early on in the conversation, we talked about uh, people. And that's absolutely the kind of attribute that I love in the people I work with, where it doesn't matter who is asking the question or who's presenting an idea. It is more about the question or the idea. That makes sense. Now, you talked about work, do, uh, working on the Chromebook a little bit. Can you walk me through what that process was like, especially not having ever worked on like a laptop before and then, you know, leading this project? Walk me through and tell me what that was like, what that experience was like. Yeah, absolutely. So when I joined the team back in 2010, they had just announced the open source project to build an operating system using a browser, which was fascinating for me. Laptops had existed for 20 years and the underlying vision and the aspiration was staggering for me that 20 years afterwards, trying to reinvent something that people just took for granted. But the more I saw what the team was trying to do, the more it made sense, which was how do we make laptops incredibly fast, simple to use, very secure, 
get better over time because you can continue to update the operating system mm-hmm. on a six weekly basis. That was insane back in Nathan to consider something like that. And to top it all, how do we bring it down to a hundred dollar level? Right? That was the goal of the team at the time so that everybody could have access to computing. So a lot of the work we were doing was trying to figure out why is the product as expensive as it is? What parts of it matter? What parts do we cut down? And as an example, if you embrace cloud storage and connectivity and always available connectivity, which in 2010 wasn't all the way there, it was getting there, but not all the way there. That's the vision of seeing where the future is going and trying to build a product for that. Then you can make a lot of simplifications of the kind of hardware you need to have under the hood. And whatever money you save on that, you can instead spend on a better display, a better trackpad, better battery, right? Similarly, using a browser as an operating system. By then, a billion people knew how to use a browser to browse the internet. Suddenly, the laptop becomes very easy to use for anyone. My proudest moment was when my, at that time, 75-year-old dad, I gave him one of our very first laptops to try and use. And it took him about two minutes to orient himself, and he was using it. And I couldn't imagine giving him any other laptop that was available at the time and not have to spend four hours trying to show him how to turn it on, how to turn it off, what to do. You open it, you see a browser, you use it, you shut it, hit it aside, you're done. That was the product we were trying to build. Yeah, and when you make it kind of that simple to where someone who isn't used to technology can figure out how to use it and how to figure it out. I remember that, you know, growing up, that was always the worst part, trying to show my parents how to use technology. And you have to explain all these steps. They don't get it, and then you have to re-explain it to them over and over. So yes. breaking it down and making it that simple, really kind of, I think that's the purpose of technology, where you can innovate, you can do a lot of new things that you pre- previously haven't been able to do, but it's simple and anyone can use it or access it. Absolutely. And it, it is all about bringing more access to more people because then great things happen. Wasn't that kind of the initiative behind Next Billion Users, right? So we at the time, there was, I think, 3 billion users that were using the internet. And so how do you get it to like the next billion users after that? who really, you know, it's completely different for them to use the internet than those who are already using the internet because they're used to it. So how do you adjust them and get them up to date, up to speed with everyone else? That was exactly the premise that Sundar and other folks at Google had seen, and they seeded a team that actually was, the center of gravity was in Asia. Caesar, who's our CEO, was the, effectively the, the founder, I can use that word, of the NBU team at Google. And what the leadership, including him, had seen was that people were arriving on the internet in a very different way from what folks, for example, in the US or other developed markets were, were doing. Literally, the very first time somebody would consume the internet was through a smartphone. Very different mindset, very different interaction mode, including with touch, yeah. smaller screen, right? A different aspect ratio. Yeah. And uh, some things were easy and some things were incredibly hard given that mode of usage. So the question that I think the team was asking themselves was, in a world that looks like this, what are the products and services we should build to make this much, much more accessible to everyone? So part of it was, how can we make smartphones cheaper so we can bring the price point down so more and more people can get online? How do we make connectivity cheaper? The team at the time had a project called Google Station, which was effectively bringing wireless Wi-Fi connectivity to uh, railway stations in India, because I, I don't remember the exact stat now, but tens of millions of people take the train every day in India. And they spend a bunch of time waiting on the platform at the station, waiting for the train to arrive. So at that time, mobile data wasn't cheap enough in India. So the premise was, why don't you provide free Wi-Fi at the station so more people can get online? Later, data became very cheap. So that was no longer necessary. But in the early days, that was the goal. Like, how do we bring all of the pieces needed to get people online. How do we build products that suit the way they are living their lives? So the whole idea of Google Pay, there was a Google Pay product, a wallet product in the US that was much more centered around credit cards. But the idea of peer-to-peer payments built from the ground up started in India for Google, where there was a realization that there was a shift happening where people are beginning to use or think of using the phone as a payment form. And the government was pushing regulation to, using regulation to drive that change. 
away from cash into using digital forms of payment to make it more accessible to everyone. And the team saw the opportunity to build something really delightful. And again, I talked about how with Chromebooks, my dad was using it. I have a very similar kind of an experience where some of the most accomplished, you know, CEOs of public companies were using Google Pay, but also my mom and dad were well into their seventies by then could also use it with very little training, right? And to be able to build a product that spans that kind of spectrum of users and sophistication, I think that is what the team was building. And you can then imagine, like, if you can build a product that scales like that, it has applicability beyond the NBU markets. So it wasn't that the team was trying to build for NBU. It was start with NBU and bring that innovation back to the rest of the days. It was a very powerful premise that the team delivered on. I think that's a, a beautiful kind of framework to have when building technology. How can we make it as frictionless as possible for someone or anyone to be able to use this technology and to immediately know how to use it and interact with it, make it easier and more accessible. And it seems like you've taken those lessons and perspectives with you from Google to Art to Finance. And now, you know, how can we make this family office thing more easier and accessible for everyone else? You're starting with accredited investors. And I read that the goal is at some point in the future to get to everyone. So not only accredited investors, but also non-accredited investors. So can you walk me through kind of what that path looks like if you had to map it out? Yeah, so in the U.S., regulations are different when you are uh, interacting with people who are accredited investors and people who are not. And the way you qualify to be an accredited investor is based on either salary or net worth or other attributes. Mm -hmm. And they're all proxies for how sophisticated you are as an investor. And there are two more tiers above that. There's something called a qualified client and then a qualified purchaser, Mm -hmm. which are higher and higher tiers of sophistication. And regulations clearly indicate like which products can be offered to which kind of clients based on the sophistication mapping. So we started with accredited investor and hardware because we are building very sophisticated products and we wanted to make sure that we had a core audience that we could offer them up to. Okay. But at the same time, we're also building products that are a lot more easy to understand, a lot more mainstream, if you will. A good example is I mentioned the diversified portfolio with the uh, with the robo-advisor kind of a construct. Multiple asset classes, static wage rebalancing on a monthly basis, with tax loss servicing. It's been around for well over a decade now. It's a much more understood concept and regulations allow us to offer that to non-accredited investors as well. So that's an example of a product we're building right now, but we know that that product is more broadly applicable and over time, we want to make sure that we are able to bring that to everybody. So that's kind of the goal is like we, we build a bunch of things that are needed for people at this level, but then a set of those that can be used below in terms of network, we are absolutely going to do that. Yeah. And that's uh that makes sense. You know, as a startup, you focus on your core customers, but you also have kind of the long-term vision of slowly broadening out or targeting other customers, but you, you still have to focus on what's the core customer and of what are your products really going to center around? I did find it interesting. I was going through your Twitter and I was looking through one of your first tweets. Let me see if I can find it here, but you reposted a article from Ben Thompson Mm. and he was talking about, I think it was, it says something like, what is Google as a company? Which I thought was interesting because a lot of people kind of call it a, a search engine company, but that seems like it does Google a big disservice. And he broke it down that, you know, Apple is a vertical player, while Google is a horizontal player. Yes. Apple monetizes off hardware, where Google monetizes off ads from other people, other users, not just their own subset of users using the platform that they provide, kind of encompassing everyone. And I guess my question is, what type of players are the finance going to become going forward or in the future? Yeah, I think our DNA is a lot more what you describe Google as. By the way, can I just say I love Ben Thompson? is incredible. Uh, I've been a subscriber for a very long time. I was for a very long time. But um, we are much more of a horizontal player. I think I mentioned a bit earlier that a bunch of us had worked on not just products, not just point products, but in areas where we were working with an entire ecosystem and trying to bring the whole ecosystem forward. 
as opposed to competing with all of them. And, and that's exactly the DNA that we are bringing to Hannah Finance. So what I mean by that is, very tangibly, I'll give you an example. We are not a private equity fund. We are not a venture capital fund. We will never raise one. Right? We're never going to go and become a VC fund because the people who do that night and day and they are incredibly good at it. What we want to do is, if we can build a platform and bring up number of users to that platform where we can deliver financial products and services, we'd rather pick the best of class financial products and services in different categories and bring those to our members. And why does that matter? No one player can build the best of everything. So you can right. do a few things really, really well, and you should, but when there is a better product out there, you'd rather embrace them and work together to, to be more successful together. Yes. The second part of it is from the member's point of view, which is actually the more important one. Let's not offer something that's worse when there's a better product available out there. So with that, if you think of it, that mentality, then you can almost imagine there are two products that we will build because we feel like there is either a gap or an area or a product where we feel we can bring something unique to that and maybe we can build something that's very specific to our users. It doesn't mean that we're better than everybody else, but maybe we're seeing a gap in something that's missing and therefore we'll build that and therefore we'll bring it to our users. So we'll build our own products like the AI managed portfolios, but a lot more of the work is on how do we build a platform that lets others bring their products and services and work together with them to offer them to the right members at the right time because that matters. All. And I think that's a great framework to have for a company because it makes you stay consumer focused, right? Where how can we help the consumer in the best way possible? Because that's our goal. So we're going to build these products, right? That fill in the gaps that we see. But if there's a better product out there, we're going to partner with them so that we can give our consumer the best possible results, the best outcome. And so, yeah, that's, I love that. It's a good framework to have. Yeah. And, and it's only in the gaps, right? And this is something that we did with the Android team. Uh, this is something we did with the payments team. And uh, it's the exact same thing we're trying to do here, which is the industry exists, is vibrant, it's healthy, has a lot of very accomplished players across the entire value chain. How do we work with as many of them as we can in a very collaborative way to bring the best of to the members that we think we are, that we are in the same? Yeah. And then I just want to kind of touch back on you talked about building a platform. And I find companies that are using AI, it's not just good enough to have the data or the model now, but you also need the platform. And so here in Art of Finance, having the data and the model, but also the platform, to me, I see that as like, that helps them really get the best results, the best outcome, and really optimize the most for these AI managed portfolios going forward in the future and also for the user experience. So I guess we're running low on time. So last few quick questions. First one. For what advice would you give your 22, 23 year old self going back? You knew you loved tech, maybe not necessarily what would you do differently, but kind of the advice or just words of wisdom you would tell them. Follow the right people, always. I said this before, you actually said it even before I did, which is it's the people that matter. I've been very lucky that very early on in my career and at multiple stages along the way, I happened to stumble upon groups of people that were just great to work with, great to learn from, where every day I could take risks. And every time I failed, I would get coaching and encouragement, not uh, the opposite, right? Like sometimes you are afraid to try things because you know if you fail, you get penalized for it. And I've been very lucky to have that kind of a, um, a group around me. A lot of times in my career, but especially right at the beginning, Definitely a couple of times where I chose differently, when the excitement of an opportunity or a space or a problem led me to go down a different path where I didn't pay enough attention to who do I get to work with and what are their values. And every one of those, it's almost like I have 80% or 90% of my career feels like one thing and then the other 10% feels like a very different thing. And it took me some time to realize because I'd made that mistake. And then you see, wait, why did this feel terrible? I'm doing the exact same stuff. Why, why does this feel so awful to me? I should love it. And I don't. And the difference was always people. And so I would probably just tell myself, save yourself the trouble. Don't even 
chairs, the shiny things, be with the right people. Is there any way to increase the surface area of getting lucky and following the right people? You have to know what you want. When I say right people, that's not the same for everyone. Everybody's wired very differently, right? I'm an introvert. I tend to be quiet. So for me, surrounding myself with the right mix of people, some who are a lot more social or going, that connect with the people that bring incredible ideas. That's very good for me to have in my group, whether it's socially or professionally. For also people who are empathetic enough to realize that I'm an introvert and I need space to think, I need the ability to step back from problems. So people have that blend is what I need personally. So it, part of it is knowing what kind of people you like to work with and then looking across their networks to see who do they trust, who do they respect and trying to figure out how do I get to also meet them and work with them because that opens doors. Yeah, and I guess it comes at the end of the day, you got to know yourself. And if you know yourself, then it can really help figure out what you want to do, who you want to be around with. The last question is, what are you most excited about with Art of Finance going forward? What kind of keeps you up at night, just getting so excited, thinking about the future, thinking about Art of Finance and, you know, taking out maybe a 10 year view of it? Yeah, 10 years is a long time. I'll tell you what keeps me up at night and there's both stuff that is, that weighs heavy and there is stuff that is exciting and they're very related. I'm working with a group of people. We are building a product that is for ourselves, our friends, our families, and their friends and their families. So for us, it's very visceral. It's very personal, right? When I build this, I use it and I can see my brother using it or my friends using it, my former colleagues using it. So it's exciting that I get to see it. It's, it's a bit like when I build Chromebooks or phones or GPA, I got to see people I love and I care about and I respect and I trust using the products. And that was fun and, and exciting. It's also very stressful because talking about people's money, and these are some of the people that are the closest to me and taking responsibility for their assets and the weight of their trust and the responsibility that we're taking on also keeps me up at night. Fast forward 10 years, what I would love to see is that we are successful in building the tools and the products and the services that let not just the attracted investor and above, but across the world, a number of people just improving their overall financial health using our products, our services, our education material. Whatever that is, like the ability to bring access and understanding and helping people help themselves. I think that's, that would be great. Yeah, and it's, I guess it is a double-edged sword, right? With fintech and then you're, you're helping those you love with their assets, but at the same time too, there's always kind of that fear of like the what if and it's, you just trust your gut and keep going. Yeah. Hopefully it all works out and, you know, Art of Finance, it seems like Art of Finance is doing a great job. You have a great team and as we discussed in the beginning, you know, the people that make the idea happen, those are price, those people are priceless. So absolutely, absolutely. Very excited about the future. Thank you, Venka, for coming on. I appreciate it. And to all the listeners out there, thank you. And we'll see you next time on Next Big Thing HQ. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.